Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm very honored to have Mr. Cy Young here with me. He's a writer and a dancer, a songwriter. I mean, he's got quite a bit to his name, and I wanted to bring him on so we could you know, learn a little bit more about him and maybe get some inspiration from his story. And so how are you today, sir? Uh, Kyle, I'm just doing just just great. I feel very good about uh, about myself and uh, man, great to meet you. Well, we met on this website called Alignable and you get to meet people that are in the general area. We're, we're pretty close. Uh, he's in San Marcos. I'm in Kyle and we're probably what, 10 minutes from each other, 10, 15 yeah, minutes. About 10 minutes. Yeah. You can make some great connections on there. I kind of, kind of like LinkedIn in a way. LinkedIn. Yeah. I, I have a lot of contacts on LinkedIn. I, I, people keep contacting me saying they want to be part of my, uh, they want to follow me and all that. And I, I, I'm not sure what that means, but I, I do have a list of them. I've got about, Two or two or three hundred of them, a uh, list of them, and uh, I occasionally contact them, and uh, they're uh, they're people just like you. <laughs> Great, you never know who you're going to talk to. It's really amazing. Oh, you can make, meet some pretty wonderful people on there, and it's better than all the other social medias like Facebook and Instagram and all that. Yeah. It's real connections, and you find out you have a lot in common, or you can help each other out. It's just I, I find it better. And it's more real to me. You don't have all that junk that they put on the other ones. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's great. I'm not too good with, uh, in terms of social networking. I, I'm, I'm a very social guy, and uh, I'm very. I like to talk to people and everything. And of course, I when I was in New York, uh, and Chicago first, and then New York, I, I love to perform. And being a performer is just. Uh, second nature you know you 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 just you walk into a, a a light and you and you start performing and uh i just i still want to do it it's still i'm i'm a very mature guy now and uh, i could get on a stage right now and perform i have a song a couple of songs that i performed that i wrote myself i, I was wrote, it was very good at writing my own material when i was at a, a place in new york called the number one fifth avenue Mm -hmm. on fifth avenue down around around 10th street and uh <clears throat> very a very famous place and i i performed there one night when i was uh, well actually i was there for two weeks but i was doing a show on broadway called subways are for sleeping with a guy named sydney chapman who was sitting who was uh, uh charlie chapman's son oh wow yeah he was a very charming guy and and uh, and so i was doing a show there and the, the show had opened on broadway and it wasn't a real success, but it ran for about six, six or eight months. But anyway, I was able to get a job uh, moonlighting after the show, like at 11 o'clock in the, in the number one Fifth Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. And so I loved it there. It was, it was a small club, but it was very prestige, prestigious. And uh, because that, that was the place to, to perform when you were in New York. People like Horse and Bean, people like that who performed there. But anyway, I, I, I got a job there and I was able to write most of my material uh, for my, myself. And some of the material was from a, a guy who had, uh, I'd been in a show with his, a guy named Stephen Vinever, who had a show off Broadway uh, called Diversions. And I was, I was in that, uh, but I, I let, uh, let me come back to that. But anyway, uh, I did my own material and one of the, one of the pieces was his. And, but anyway, I got very good reviews. I was very thrilled that I got great reviews and Stephen didn't get that great a review. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. But uh, I did perform and I liked to perform. And I would now, I would, I would like to go to fire, uh, the firehouses, mm -hmm. firemen, where guys are sitting you know, when they're not working, when they're not out to the fire. 
I don't have to go and perform for them just because they give sort of give back to them, you know, because they've done what they've done, I think, is, is what they do is an amazing, amazing thing. And most of those guys are just really solid guys. But I would like to do that. But I'm, I'm, I'm hampered right now because I don't have transportation and uh, <coughs> I couldn't do it. But anyway, um, so I've, I've done a lot of stuff. And then when I was, I, I mentioned uh, this uh, director in New York and producer named Stephen, and uh, he, um, he had a show called Diversions, which was a, a little four, four character show. Mm. And you just stand up on a stage and sing, they do stuff. <clears throat> and uh, one night a guy came to see the show with another guy, and his name was Fred, Fred, um, Fred, some, you know, what, what was his last name, Fred? Anyway, he's a big and very, very important writer. Mm. And um, he liked my work and he was doing stuff and he wanted me to, to perform with him, you know. And um, so I uh, you know, performed his shows and material. So I started doing that and it was, it was really great. There was a, a club called the, the, uh, uh, the Blue Angel in the Lower East Side in New York. And uh, we did a show there and some other shows. And this was, Fred was not too, too popular, too famous at that time, excuse me. But he became famous. <clears throat> he wrote a show called Chicago. He wrote a song called, I'm Jack and Martin. I'm leaving today. He wrote to the New York. Oh, New York. wow. And yeah, very, very, he, got, he must have so much, have had so much money. He's not with us anymore. But anyway, it was, uh, it was the early days of, uh, you know, when he was performing and, and I was performing, and I was doing a lot of stuff. So it was kind of, we, it was, it was really, really great to be able to be with someone who was the, the, the top guy on Broadway. <laughs> it was really, really interesting. But anyway, that's just one of the few things I did. So anyway, I'm blabbing here. Should I, would I, should I say something else? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all about you, man. Uh, oh, and you had a song that you wrote that Barbara Streisand did, didn't you? Yeah, I was uh, I was working with a guy. Uh, we were doing some songs and stuff in New York, and uh, I met him at a, a group called the um, BMI Workshop. A BMI is a broad, Broadcast Music Incorporated. It's a music licensing firm like ASCAP. You've heard mm -hmm. of ASCAP? Yes. Those are the two big li music licensing firms. Well, at that time, BMI had only rock singers, <coughs> rock rock people, and they didn't have anybody in the musical theater department. So they what they did was they put together a a, 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 a class of people that they could help bring them along in terms of writing for the for, for the theater, like Fred Ebb, like uh, he was a composer, a lyricist, and uh, they had there was a a, a top a Broadway composer. And you know, actually, he was not a composer so much as a conductor, Lehman Engel. And Lehman was very popular, very big, and very very hot. And so they got him to to be in, in charge of this uh, this uh, show. Uh, and um, it was not really a show; it was a class. We would meet every couple of times a week. We would do songs and stuff, and and, and write a song for uh, for this scene. Write a song for. Uh, for Stanley to sing in, in Streetcar, you know, something like that, uh, to, to, to uh, try your wings and try try writing material for, for different situations and that sort of thing, so that you could train yourself to write for, for the theater. Right. And it was very it was very interesting. It was very good, and uh, I got uh, got to, to be pretty good in that. And I had written, I wrote a couple of shows, and uh, with you know with his aegis, and uh, so it was um, a, a very interesting. And, and wonderful time to be in the theater in New York because it was it was they were just bringing along the musical theater uh, quite a bit and uh, I uh, I got into that wrote uh, two or three shows and uh, and so I, I'm getting to Streisand uh, a guy that I was working with and writing, writing some music with with BMI a guy named uh, Hughes Bob Hughes uh, I saw him once on the street he said hey Cy uh, Streisand is going to be in town. She's looking for looking for songs, so she's uh, you know the people who are she wants to see a bunch of composers, New York New York composers. So he said, "Why don't you come along?" I said, "Okay, great." So I I went went along with Bob, and we, we go into this. I think it was some what was it some probably hotel or something, and it was a studio, 
and, and Streisand was there. And I'd, I'd seen Streisand many times in the, a place called the Upstairs at the Downstairs, uh, which was a club on 56th Street between 6th and 5th. And I was performing there for four, five, three or four years. And uh, she was, she'd come in there all, you know, all the time with uh, her then uh, husband, I believe it was Big Tall Guy, what was his name? You know, her oh, first husband. I know <laughs> you're talking about, I can't think of the name. I can't think of the name either. <laughs> she'd come in there with all the time. And, and it was, it was a, the, the club was pretty small. And um, she would sit up there and, was, you know, it's right there, we'd just be in front of her and we'd see her. And so she wasn't a stranger and I was a stranger to her. Anyway, so we, people, you know, there were, I'd say about 10, 15 people there. And uh, we all, everybody would sit down and do a song or two. And, and I sat down and I said, I had, I, I, the way I wrote this song, it's very interesting. I had just spent three months focused in, in my New York apartment, focused on writing a show called That Hat which was an adaptation of Italian straw hat by Eugene Labiche and then Marc Michel. Okay. And it was, it, was a, it was a cute idea. It was a, it was a, a situation that took place in, I think it was in Italy, and it was, had to do with a horse and, and a hat. And this, the whole idea was that this woman uh, was, uh, she was married to this very wealthy guy, and, but she had a lover. And so she would meet with this lover and she'd go in the park and ride on ride her in this part of the park. And so one day this guy named Ferdinand, he was riding for some reason in the park and he had his horse, he was riding his horse in a carriage and he stopped and he didn't realize it, but his, the, there was a hat, this woman who was having an affair had put her hat, Italian straw hat on this tree. And, and Ferdinand didn't realize that his, his her horse was eating that hat. Oh no! So so, uh, when they got through, you know, when he suddenly realized she, the, the the girl got up and she woman she got up, she said, "Oh, you oh, you you mean you my hat? My husband gave me that hat. Oh, this is terrible! So you've got to get you've got to get another hat." And the whole thing was a Italian straw hat was the whole idea of, of them trying to get another hat for her. <laughs> so I wrote a show about it. It was really cute. I had some great songs. In it. I was a, really a good performer. I had one song called uh, 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 "The Apology." I'd like to do it for you sometime. It's really fast. I can still do it. I still know it. Anyway, uh, we did that show, and uh, it was uh, uh, it, 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 it was produced later on. But anyway, uh, so uh, I happened to be in there with with uh, Barbara and uh, with the people, and so I, I the reason oh, I'm re the reason I'm telling you the story about that hat was that it was a very creative period for me. For three months, I didn't do anything but write. I wrote, wrote, wrote like 12 hours a day. And wow. what that did for me was I got to a very, very high inspirational period where I just, I just felt really on top of everything. So I finished that show. I finished the show and I sat down at the piano and I started diddling and I went with da, 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 da. I came up with that figure and I wrote this song in five minutes because of the inspirational surge. And it was, it was, the, it was the, that song. It was uh, uh, the, uh, the song that I played for Barbara. And she loved it. She loved it. She said, oh, I love that song. I want, I want that song, I want that song. Well, what happens with people you know, like that, they, they, they uh, give it to their manager, Marty, Marty, Marty Ehrlichman. I knew Marty, I knew Marla, I knew all these people. So six months later, I hadn't heard from him. And uh, so there was another friend of mine who was uh, pretty well known, a guy who had written some of the music for uh, an, a, a big Broadway show. <coughs> Excuse me. And his wife was a singer. And um, she, she loved the song too. And uh, I didn't really want anybody else to do it, but I, I wanted Barbara to do it. And her, eventually her manager called me and said, uh, I wrote you that letter about that song. I, I, I said, well, yeah, the song is yours whenever you want it. So finally, they did, they did do the song. They did record the song with uh, uh, Sid Raymond, who was a wonderful, wonderful uh, arranger. And it was just, in the, and the song, it just, it just was wonderful. But then what happened was this, this uh, gal who was, uh, her name was Sandy Stewart. 
and her husband was Moose Sharp. And uh, so she recorded the song too, which was a big mistake on my part mm. to let that happen because Barbara said, gee, Cy, I was going to do this as a single, not just as, as my, which, which she did do. She did it as a, a recording on the, on, the, on the recording, on the, mm. the disc. And she also did it as an open, she opened it, one of her, uh, one of her shows with it. Or, you know, she was doing specials at the time. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting. She did that, but she didn't do it as a single. Do you know how much money that would have been? I can only imagine. She would do it because somebody else had done the song. But anyway, you know, you, that's how you live, Kyle. You, you learn these things and say, why didn't I listen? I had another <laughs> situation. So I just blab on here. Go for it. After, after that, uh, that hat, I, my, my show uh, was produced and it wasn't produced very successfully. <clears throat> um, uh, one of the big agents in New York said, Cy, um, why don't you get, a, get, get, get half a dozen ideas and, uh, and, 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 come, and then come back here in, the, in a week and, and tell us what the ideas are and then maybe you can write something. I said, mm -hmm. okay. So then, then there was a producer involved with that, a big Broadway producer. And, uh, so I, I got some ideas and uh, I lived in an apartment on 57th and 9th Avenue. It was great. I had a view of the, of the Empire State Building. It was really exciting. It was that romantic BS, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I came back with six ideas and I came up and this one was uh, called Doris. And I pitched all the ideas and then I finally got to Doris. And I said, okay, let me tell you about Doris. Doris is, uh, here's a story. There's a guy who works for a, for a uh, he's uh, um, he's a writer mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, he writes stuff and he, he works for a magazine. Um, and the magazine has him go out and do, do uh, you know, go out on different uh, gigs and stuff and, and report on things. And then, so he got the, he, he gets the, uh, here's the, here's the crux. He gets a, 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 a job to go out and interview a gal who's uh, actually what it is is a a, a group of, of, of women who were in the uh, in, in the uh, the very very uh, a new vague kind of crazy uh, new new stuff where they were just uh, meeting in a hotel. They're all going to meet in a hotel and we're going to talk about stuff and everything. And it was like a women's lib group, you know, that kind of thing. And so he goes in and he, he, he can't get in there because it's, he's not dressed as he's, he's not a woman. So he goes, I says, okay, well, I'm going to get in there. So he goes and he dresses up as a woman. He goes in there, he gets in there. And while they're in there, right, ne right next door, there's uh, one of the husbands of the, of the uh, one of the women is a fireman. And they meet next, right next door. And they come in with their hoses, their fire hoses and everything. And the middle of the meeting of the women's lib meeting, it's all crazy and you know, all the crazy stuff. But for the guys, they didn't, they hated them. They went, they broke in there and they sprayed them with the, with the water. They sprayed with the water. And I, you know, the cops come and everything. And they, they and these girls get, women get thrown into, into, into jail. And, and, and my guy is there, Lamp, his name is Lamp. He's there as this woman, Doris. And he, and he, and he becomes one of them. And he does the whole thing, holding him reporting about. It. Does that sound familiar? You see, you hear there was a every every thirty years there was a show where there's a guy who's dressed as a woman. Mm -hmm. There was something in 1930 uh, called Where's Charlie? Um, Charlie's Aunt. Then uh, there was uh, Some Like It Hot. Then there was Dustin Hoffman and his piece. And there should be something right now. My piece probably should be done now. I didn't, didn't, didn't get that. But anyway, so. Uh, um, the whole idea is that he, he he's with these women and it's, it's, he falls in love with the girl and she falls in love with, with, well, she doesn't fall in love with him because he's really a, a girl. But, but anyway, it goes back and forth. And um, finally, they, all the women found, find out that it's a, he's a man and they chase him and they, uh, it's all, you know. but anyway, it was a, it was a great, a great uh, idea. And uh, these, these agents loved it and they promoted it. And I got a lot of people very excited about it. Uh, Gene Wilder's agent was hot for it. Um, and I had, I actually had at my little apartment in, in 47th, in uh, 57th and 9th Avenue, I had a, a, had a, a producer, <clears throat> Joe Manduke from Hollywood, 
flew out to New York, came up to my apartment, sat down in front of me and said, Cy, I want to do Doris. You do, you, you, you raise 750 and I'll raise 750. I said, okay. <laughs> so what I should have said was give me a letter and that, that would be, but then I, I did have a couple of contacts who had a lot of money and, um, but I couldn't get the money. I couldn't get the money raised. But what I should have done is found a way to found a way to do that because that would have been that would have been the, the thirty year next show for a woman a guy just as a woman. Mm, but anyway, so. anyway, so that was just one of the little things that I, I I had a lot of little situations like that where I had very very strong opportunities. Oh, another let me give you another idea. I did um, on a clear day. Which was a song, which was a, a, a musical that Barbara Streisand did with Howard Keel. Uh, did she do it with Howard Keel? I don't know who she did it with in the, in the movie. She did it in the movie, and I did it in a package with Howard Keel down in Florida, mm -hmm. Grove, Grove Playhouse, and I got great reviews in a number called "Wait Till You're 65. 10, 20, 30, then you're 30, Wait Till You're 65. I staged it myself, and I got stopped the show every single night. Well, we got the show closed. I got back to New York, and they they did we did it on the road, and and they got back to New York, and uh, I was up in uh, Marty Star Marty uh, Ehrlichman's office, Barbara Streisand's manager, uh, and I was doing some material for him, and went along with Moose, mm -hmm. and um, at that time, that's when they were getting ready to do the movie of On a Clear Day, and I said, Marty. You know, I did that show and I was great. I got great reviews. I love to be do that and be her play, play her husband, her, her, uh, her boyfriend. And Marty Ehrlichman, yeah, he said, he, said, he just laughed and said, oh, yes, I sure. Well, I should have said, Marty, I'm not kidding. I mean it. I want to go, I want to fly to California. Streisand knows me. I want to go and I want to audition for her. But I didn't do that. Mm. I'm so much smarter now than I was when I was young. <laughs> Yeah, think, hindsight's uh, twenty twenty, right? <laughs> I know. I think about the the, the, the things I just left off and goofed off on, and uh, and uh, it's really a uh, it's really a kind of a nice chance to be able to express all this because I I feel very frustrated about a lot of it, but all I did right. do a lot of things too. So a lot of things were were successful, uh, but there was so many so much opportunity there. Uh, just so much going on for me, and I had a lot of. A lot of opportunity and a lot of things I did do that were successful. Well, you had plays and musicals that were produced yeah, and performed. I wrote, I, I wrote three plays, and eventually I did one of them off off Broadway. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, I went to California for a while, and I did, I wrote the radio shows for Heartbeat Theater, which was the uh, uh, Salvation Army. I wrote about forty shows for them. That was really fun because you're writing for a, 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 a medium that's just hearing. You just hear it, and it was really fun. I enjoyed that. So, how did you end up getting hooked up with Rankin and Bass? Uh, that's a, that's interesting. I'm trying to remember how I did that. I got I came back from California, mm -hmm. and I'd done some television there, not a lot, but some. And uh, I think I heard that they were doing that they were doing they were doing uh, Silverhawks. Right. I don't know if you ever saw that, but it was it was a show, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, an animation show, and um, so I went down to see the guy who was doing it. He was an English guy, and uh, I told him it was in my experience. He said, "Oh, that's great!" He said, "I love to have you." He said, "We, I can, I can give you a bunch of shows to, to write," and so they he started off. He gave me a show, not a lot, three thousand bucks. That was something, and it wasn't like in like in Hollywood, but. Uh, so I did that, and it was very successful. And um, he said, yeah, "I need you know, a couple, do, do some more." So I did a two that were kind of dovetail, one that one that uh, the ended ending led to it something else, which is great. So it was three shows, but I got there late. I got there when they were just the, the ending of the shows. So I just did three, mm. but I enjoyed writing for for animation. It was a totally different uh, different viewpoint. And uh, it was interesting because you're just doing everything has to be auditory. And, um, and then, I, of course, I was writing screen, uh, screenplays, too. <clears throat> I didn't sell any. I, I did have some option. <coughs> Excuse me. But, um, yeah, so I did, some, I did some plays, 
some screenplays. I did radio. I did animation. I did songs. I performed. I uh, performed uh, in clubs and stuff. And uh, I was a dancer first, and I got away from that. But anyway, I, I did kind of around the gamut of everything, uh, Kyle. And it was really, really a great, a great ride. I just loved it, and I, I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to stop, and I, I was a fool. I shot myself in the foot because I was mad when my last, my second show closed, and it didn't run very long. And I said, I'm going to screw you, New York. <laughs> Back with you. And I went to, went to California. And that was a mistake because I didn't know anybody in California. And nobody knew me. And I was a performer. I was a New York guy. You know, I was, I was a New York guy. And uh, performing and writing and everything. And, and so uh, it kind of put a, a grinch in my career. Because when you come back, you know, 10 years later, nobody knows who you are. Well, they do know. I did uh, send some pictures out I said, to an agent, a very top agent. And he said, is this the, the sign young? I said, yeah. I said, come on down. I'm going to sign you. And so he signed me up and he got me, got me some jobs, got me some work. And uh, in fact, he got me a, a show out in Long Island uh, called, uh, it was, uh, what was the name of that show? It was uh, about, um, well, I'll think about it in a minute. Anyway, I did they did that. Uh, Will Rogers, Will Rogers Follies. That's what it was. Okay. And it was it was it was a pretty good show, and we did it out there. And I did Will Rogers' father. And uh, this agent, who was you know agents are very snotty, and they, they were at that time. And, and he said he said, "Sai, you're really in luck. I'm going to be out there. I live out in that area. I'm going to I'm going to come and see you in the show with my friend. His friend, of course, was his lover. So." Uh, so I said, okay. So I opened in the show, got great reviews. I always got great reviews when I was performing. And, and uh, so uh, he came to see the show with his friend on a matinee. My wife was there too at that time. That time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, did, I finished the show. I came down, you know, I got, got out of my makeup. I really got down the steps. I walked down the steps and he was down there with this, with this guy. He said, Sai, you're better than you've ever been. Guy, you're great. You're just great. <laughs> and this guy was raving about me. I said, okay, take it easy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and these guys don't, they don't do that. This is a, a top New York agent. I mean, the top. And he said, I got a lot of shows coming up. I got a lot of things coming up. I want you to get, you got to get me some shows. So I said, okay. So, uh, Anyway, that that was great. Then I went back to New York and I, I went up for shows and I didn't get anything. I didn't get anything mm -hmm. because nobody knew who I was, I guess. That's why. So were you born in New York? Huh? Were you born in New York? No, no. I was born in, in Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas. And, okay. And went to Kansas City and we lived, well, I was brought up in Kansas City and I left in uh, 19, uh, not, and uh, 17 years later, I had to go to uh, uh, Northwestern. I was there for four years, and then I went right down to to Chicago and and down in ballet. <clears throat> so it was ballet. It was Topeka to Kansas City to Chicago to New York to there you go. <clears throat> so anyway, I so I uh, <clears throat> I got around a lot and uh, did a lot of good stuff and and um, you never do enough, Kyle. You know I'd I'd love to walk into a stage right now and perform. I'd like it. I I would probably be pretty good at it still. My voice is still good. La! Yeah. I can sing very well. Wow. <laughs> I hope I could sound that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, um, I have a son who's brilliant, and he's a better singer than I am. He has a four octave range. Oh. He has an incredible voice, and he has come up with some. He's very brilliant. He has come up with exercises that are very good for the voice. And I just do those voice, I those uh, exercises about half an hour a day. Well, my voice is just staying really, really sharp, right up in front of my in my mask. You know where it is, <clears throat> and uh, it's um, once you learn to sing, if you if you stay with it, you can really keep going. Uh, I think most opera singers stop when they get to be in their fifties because uh, opera singing is incredibly difficult. It's harder than anything else because when you hear those guys saying la 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 la. la. I mean, those songs, they sing way up high, way up for a long, you know, they hold a note forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, singing for opera is really hard. 
it's like belly dancers last uh, probably from their, their 18 to 8, 8 to, to 28 or 30 at the most. You, you just can't last very long. So, uh, you can sing last long as a, as a singer. Uh, if I could sound like anybody, I would always want to be Freddie Mercury. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that guy had a range. I, didn't, I don't know him. Uh, the, the lead singer from Queen. Oh, okay, okay. Well, some of those singers that did uh, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, Chuck said that one of the guy that does that aria, he mm -hmm. said he's got the best, greatest voice in the world you've ever heard. And uh, some of that, that was a really good score. That was a really only good score, I think, that that team wrote. But boy, was it powerful. It was so really good on top of all that, you write books as well. Well, I've, I've, uh, I've sort of shifted over into that because that's where the action is. You can write now, if you can learn how, the writing is not the problem. Writing is very, very simple for me. And uh, I still have, you have to go out and have to get there and you know, sit down and do it. Mm -hmm. But the uh, hard thing is the uh, is promoting and learning how to do all the uh, ads and how to do the, the uh, algorithms and how to how to uh, pace everything and how to get the uh, uh, to, to do the networking. You have to network. You got to network everything, and you've got to yes. do. Uh, there's so many angles in this guy. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, I've got like on my computer, <clears throat> I have about forty or fifty uh, emails that are sitting there and each one of them has something that I, I can do, I have to do, I have to work on, I have to work on this, I have to work on that. Like I told you, I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna get the, the books of Dave, Dave uh, Cogren and he's really sharp. He's the, one of the sharpest guys there is in terms of marketing mm -hmm. and just go over those books and go over and over and over until they get them and then do that, you keep doing it. And uh, if, if you do that and then you, you keep at it, you can get to the point, I can see how I can get to the point where you have sales that are constant, not just a big flush, you know, a big uh, wave of sales, but they, they are con they're constant. You learn how to move, move them, uh, move them along. So they keep going steadily. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so it's, it's, it's a great challenge. It's a great challenge for me at my age and uh, well, for any, at anybody's age, but uh, it's really, it's it's an opportunity for me that I can do something that you know I I, I probably couldn't do. Then I don't know what else I could do to be creative. Now huh. I could sing. I could go to a firehouse and sing. <laughs> They'd love me. I do a bit. I, if we get together, I'm going to do a bit for you called the Buster Buster Keaton called the One Arm Piccolo Player. Have you ever heard of that? No. Well, I can't tell you about it because it's uh, <clears throat> it's a little risque. <laughs> but if, you, if we get a chance, I'll definitely do it for you. <laughs> but I do it for us. Uh, they laugh for about ten minutes. Oh my Buster god! Keaton was a wonderful guy. He, he's a, that's a whole story right there. <clears throat> when I worked with Buster, uh, we were worked on the road about eight, eight or nine months, and then he'd go. We and I came back to New York when the show closed. He went to California, but every time he. Uh, Every time he'd come to New York, he'd stay in the Central Park South there. And he'd call me and I'd go in there and we'd, we'd go right in there and my wife would, you know, he had a wife, his wife was very sweet. <clears throat> and uh, we'd play a game, we'd sit down and play a game. You know? And uh, he was just a very sweet, very sweet guy. <clears throat> he told me all kinds of stories. Do we have time now? Do we have some Oh, time? you can talk all you want. Uh, Buster was, uh, you know, he was there in the early days of Hollywood. And he mm -hmm. told me some great stories. He said, you know, so I said, uh, in the early days, they were doing the, uh, all they had all the, uh, all the guys who were running Hollywood were in Cal and were in New York and at New York, but occasionally they come out to New York and, and uh, they come out from New York to Hollywood and uh, they would look at the shows and watch me, you know, and everything. And I said, and I was just getting started. I was just getting well known. And a whole bunch of guys came from New York to uh, to California, and he said uh, there were uh, two or three of them. He said, and he said, and they asked me. They uh, they the be the the guys in, at the studio asked me to pick them up. And he said, so what I did was I you know with a great car and I, I I pretended to be the chauffeur. They didn't know who I was yet. 
I was was I was not I was not quite big that famous. So I picked him up. I had a chauffeur's outfit on, you know, gloves and everything, white gloves, and and I was very I never said anything. And I met them at the train station because it was trains then. Met them at the train station. I never said a word. I let them in. Then you know they there were like, like four of them. They came in, sat in the back, and we took off. And I <laughs> I took off like a bat. And, and you know, and and resort on corners and everything, and they're really fast and, and just missing other cars. And they said, so finally, the PSD resistance is I came to a streetcar track, came to a streetcar. Oh no, it was a train. He said, I came to a train, and there were two train track tracks. He said, and I, the, I, I, I saw the car right in the middle of the tracks. There was just enough room. He said, I, I'd gone over it before. I knew I could do it, and I had just enough room in back, and just enough room in front. He said, and we stalled there, and there are two trains coming, one coming from each direction. <laughs> These guys practically peed in their pants with the trains zipped by them. And he finally took him to the studio and then found out who he was. He said, <laughs> another, time, another time was Thanksgiving. We had another bunch come out from New York. They said, and they still didn't you know they, they weren't, they went on, we went on the assumption that they wouldn't, if they didn't look at you, if, if you were just a nobody, like a waiter or something, they wouldn't even look at you. So he said they came in and then we we had we had them there for, for you know for half an hour to an hour or so before dinner and we came brought them to the table a beautiful oh beautiful it was like twenty people set up it was just gorgeous you know chandeliers and and all kinds of stuff <clears throat> and Fatty Arbuckle who was very famous at that time Fatty Arbuckle had them over to his house so that's where they were Fatty Arbuckle's house mm -hmm. so 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 he said I was the waiter. He said, through the whole dinner, said, I was waiting on them. And they never said anything to me. They didn't know who I was. They didn't look at me. They never, I never said a word. And I would wait on them. I took and did everything they wanted. I wanted. He said, and so about an hour, and finally at the end of the dinner, uh, uh, when, at the, no, at, 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 actually not the end, but the beginning, he said, when they were, we, we had been having cocktails and everything, we were going to bring out the turkey. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring out the turkey. He said, and so they build up and build up to it and all the mixed drink. And Fatty Arbuckle was saying, oh, we got this great turkey. And we got oh, a guy here who's very good as a waiter. He's blah, blah, blah. And oh, there he comes. Okay. So they said, okay. He, Fatty Arbuckle said, okay, Buster, bring the turkey in. Buster comes in, very regal. He's got the turkey. You know, oh, and it's a tur it's a 25 pound, it's a huge turkey. And it's got all kinds of beautiful stuff all around it, you know, all of the settings and everything. And, he, and, he, and, he, and it's, it's a long table and he walks in and he walks toward the table and he trips her, boom! And the whole turkey goes down the floor. Oh <laughs> and no. And uncle grabs him and he shakes him, you silly bar. And he takes him into the kitchen and they're throwing pots and pans around, yelling at each other. And then finally he stops. Buster comes out with another perfect turkey. And he comes out and he said, gentlemen, I would like to meet you to meet your next star, Buster Keaton. <laughs> and that was their introduction to Buster. Oh, wow. And that was the early days of, of film. It was really good. It was really great for him. And he did some, he did some great movies, you know, on the rail, the train and stuff like that, and boat. And uh, anyway, so that was Buster, but he uh, was a great guy. Now, has there ever been a point in your career that you just felt like you weren't going to do anything, you just wanted to give up, or have you just always never. had that? Never, never. I thought I could, I could, I could perform. I could perform on the, on the edge of an edge of a sword. I could do. I, I feel I could work anywhere. Uh, well, I, I got to, I got to tell you one more about one more colorful character, if you don't want. To. Sure, go for it. Uh, when I lived in uh, Man in New York City on. 57th Street. Mm -hmm. 57th is the most expensive street in the world when you get further east. But I was on the west side. I was on in between uh, um, on 9th Avenue, just off of 9th Avenue, on uh, uh, between between 9th and 10th, on 57th. 8th, 8th Avenue was a little further over. It was over on 8th. And it was a, a place called 408 West 57th. And it was kind of kind of a nice place. It had a, an awning and everything. It was eight floors, and on the eighth floor, at the end of the floor, when I moved in there, there was a family living there. It was mm -hmm. called Tony Rocca, the Rocca family. Well, Tony Rocca 
happened to be one, a world-class wrestler. He was one of the top wrestlers at that time. And uh, he was uh, <clears throat> incredible. And uh, I'd see him in the elevator. This guy, his shoulders were taking, would take up the whole elevator. And I'd say, hey, Tony, how are you doing? He'd say, absolutely terrific. And he would just, just, just energy just oozing out of this guy. And he's just incredible. Well, he told me some stories that were really, that my wife, my wife, Jane, my wife said, oh, come on, he's, always, he's, just, he's just talking. I said, well, maybe, but boy, he sure looked like, like he could back it up. Anyway, he told me some, some of the stories that, uh, that he had, uh, things he had done. He said the way he got, got noticed was he was uh, playing uh, um, football, uh, soccer, soccer in Italy. By the way, Tony, when he was born, was 19 pounds. Good grief. Have you no idea how big this guy was. 19 pounds when he was born. When he was 10 years old, he was in Italy during World War II. Mm -hmm. he, 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 uh, he rescued a guy from, from drowning. And then he walked out of Italy because they, he didn't want to go into the army. They were going to try to put him in the army. I had 10 because <clears throat> of the way he looked. Jeez. Yeah, but anyway, he was playing, he was playing soccer in, uh, in Italy. And this uh, wrestler saw him and said, and because and, and Tony was up, head and shoulders above everybody and running and did it. Oh, taking over. And this guy said, you know, you make a great wrestler. So <clears throat> what they did was he trained, tra trained Tony to be a wrestler. And um, he got to be really good. His, uh, his premier thing was he would jump up in the air and then lay flat and kick kick the guy in front of him and knock him down. Okay. Amazing. And I saw it. I, I, I saw him do it. He, he had a, he was with a famous uh, a sportscaster and he was uh, doing that. He had, had, had taped that. Anyway, so, uh, but anyway, he became a, a famous wrestler. <clears throat> and uh, some of the stories he told me, I'll just tell you a few. He said, uh, you know, during World War, at the end of World War II, um, there was a Japanese wrestler who was who just hated this country because we had beaten him. We had beaten his company, his country, and we had he's a lot, lot they lost face because of me, of, of us. And he was wrestling, and he was wrestling all over the country. He would he came on a tour to the United States and he tried to hurt people. He said he really almost killed you know, some some wrestlers. Mm. So he wanted to, he wanted to wrestle me. I said, okay. So he said, we had this, I was somewhere in Singapore or someplace on, uh, in a different country. <clears throat> so he said, so we had this match. Sai, this guy was incredible. He was so strong. And, uh, and we went over about 12 rounds and I thought he was going to kill me. I thought he was going to do it, but he said, I was able to, I was able to overcome it. I overcome it, but I had to kill him. I had to kill him, otherwise he was going to kill me. And um, I, I could just see Tony doing a, 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 how how he could do that because he just it was an incredible guy. Uh, he told me several. He was also worked with the uh, uh, worked with the uh, I believe the CIA and the FBI, and he was probably had something to do with the hitman, maybe for the uh, for the mafia at some point. But he did, uh, he, told us, he told my wife and I about some assignments he said he was given. One was to go to, to Germany, uh, to East Germany, mm -hmm. and rescue a, a scientist. He said, and, uh, and I said, I went over there and I found this guy and I was about to bring him back and they, they, they saw me. He said, and they shot, they shot us, they shot at us. He said, I'll show you, I'll show you the, the bullet. He pulls up, he pulls his pants down, he shows a, a scar in his right hip where the, where the bullet went. And uh, I said, we got back okay. He said, another time I went to, uh, I went to, uh, I, was at, I was at a party. All these men were at this party and they had invited me. And he had been obviously been set up by, by the CIA or somebody. He said, so I went to this party and uh, there were like 20 guys, 20 men there. Like, so I think they were Asian. And he said, so we had, we had lunch. And I said, thank you, gentlemen. He said, dessert is on me. He pulled out a submachine gun and killed them all. Mm. 
Now, I can see him doing that. I can see him as possible that he did that. And uh, and another time, my wife and I were with with uh, his wife and uh, up in his apartment in about 10 o'clock at night. And uh, Joyce, she had been a, 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 a stewardess and he may have married her. And uh, to give you an, to give you an interesting uh, thing about that, it, it, and let me, but let me finish this. Uh, he said, uh, let me see if I can, if I can follow through on this. Uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. He, uh, we were, we were up with Joyce. We were having coffee, and uh, we, we suddenly we heard the elevator open, well, the elevator door open, and we heard a, a huge burp. And Joyce said, Tony went into the water. I said, we said, well, he said, he said, he, he flies airplanes for the Air Force. He tests them and uh, he goes into the water sometimes. He comes in, he sits down and he said, I want to play you some, play something for you. He pulls out a little recorder and he turns it on. And here's, you hear him, hear the, 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 the jet. Uh, taking off, mm -hmm. climbing. He said, I'm climbing up to, 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 to 100,000 feet. You hear it? And then you hear it, the dive. It's diving down. He's screaming. He said, blood was coming out of my nose, out of my eyes, everywhere. <laughs> he was testing this, this, this jet. And, and he, he, you know, he, he pulled out, but he did test it. And uh, he told me once, he said, you know, he said, uh, he said, they have a, they have a, a, a some kind of a, a thing that you put in the in the, in the ocean. It's supposed to stop sharks. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work, Sai. <laughs> but anyway, he survived it. But anyway, he uh, he was quite a guy. Another time, I was I was I'll tell you one more story. Uh, I was coming down the elevator at four hundred eight, and Tony was in there, and he had a little brown sack with him. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tony, what are you doing? He said, I got a he got a I got a meeting over here at the hotel. He said, uh, I said, what's in the sack? He said, oh, so I got a, uh, <clears throat> got a bottle in there. And uh, he said, if uh, I get in the hotel there, I get in the room and uh, they're trying to want to try to kill me. So I take the bottle and I open it and I break it and it's gas. <sighs> Goes all over. Another time he was coming back on 57th street and there was construction there. And some woman was some guy grabbed a woman, tried to rape her. <laughs> grabbed his gun and went in there. That was the end of that. Uh, anyway, it was uh, if it was all phony, then God bless him. He did a great job. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I just I, I just I love Tony, and he was uh, he really, really liked me a lot too. And we were we had uh, really good. Uh, and he was he was killed. He was they think we think he was murdered coming back from Cuba, and uh, something I think he said they thought he got poisoned. Somebody got to get David. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he was like 59. Anyway. Mm. So that was a, a, a kind of an interesting part of living in New York and having all that going on. And it was, I, I, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed and loved New York. My wife and I both did. Wow, we wouldn't want to be there now though. You, uh, you have met some incredible people. You've done some incredible things and you, I mean, your whole life is an inspiration. Well, that's that's good to know that I, I think that it's uh, I think that I think that every everything is possible, everything good is possible. I think you you there are always going to be challenges, but the way I look at it is a challenge is a chance to grow, the challenge yeah. is a chance to get better, the challenge is a chance. Well, I didn't do it really that well, but I can do it better this time. And I think I think that when you start your life you don't know where you are and you're just kind of dumb and stupid and then you finally come out maybe you come out a little bit and you you see a little a little light and uh but i'm very grateful where i am now i'm very grateful that i i, I just want to grow and i want to do good and i want to be helpful and uh, i want to uh, you know i want good things for everybody i Thank mean you. everybody i mean if, if it's if it's a bad guy maybe he'll learn in my book in my in my, my third book of my trilogy kicker uh, it's uh, it's about uh, a, a a star kicker for the new york giants and on the uh, on his time off 
he becomes a, a private investigator and he investigates and does this stuff. And uh, I have it early in the first book that he, he tells the story about his little sister who was, was murdered when she was, we, she was four years old, <clears throat> this guy, you know, and, and, and it's a horrible thing all hanging over him <clears throat> because she was the captain. She was just, it was just terrible. And uh, uh, so it kind of is kind of a thread through book one, book two, book three. At the end of book three, uh, he gets a call from a monastery in, in uh, Greece. Some guy is calling him. And uh, I, uh, the monk, a monk says, there's someone here who has to, says he has to see you. And so, uh, so Frankie thinks it might be something to do with his, his Mary Alice, his sister, his little sister. And so he goes there and he goes there and he meets this, you know, on this parapet, on this, on this uh, uh, place up way up high in the mind. It's one of those monasteries, it's on a rock. And it's just there with nothing supporting it. And uh, it, it ends up being the guy who killed his little sister. And he wants, he, he's had, a, he's had a, a, a moment and he's, he wants to be forgiven. And uh, it's very, very touching and very moving. And, and I, and I, I'm mad, Frank, Frankie forgives him. So where can people find your book? Uh, well, I just, the first two have been published. They're on uh, right now. They're ebooks right, right. now. On, uh, on Amazon, a K K P K D D K D P, and uh, but I'm and I'm I'm publishing the third one uh, this week, and uh, but I want to I want to publish uh, one, two, and three in terms of paperback, too, so we can get them. Uh, and uh, I've got to get the got to get covers my covers straight. I I've got my covers for the for the the uh, ebook, and I've got to get a cover for the paperback. And then I think I'm going to get one for, uh, I'm going to do a hardcover too, eventually. And then I want to get some, uh, uh, some probably some uh, money who can translate it into a different language. Eventually, that's, that's, that's down the road. But uh, I would say probably by the end of November, I should have the, uh, all three books published, ebook and paperback. And all you have to do is just go to the, the, the uh, the browser and type in uh, kicker by Cy Young and it'll come up. Okay. I'm, Cause I want to put links up in the description so people can. Oh, that'd be so great. Kyle. I'd love that. That'd be sensational. And uh, cause I'm, I'm doing a lot of doing as much. Pro, I'm learning how to really, really have promo. And the more promo pro, promoing you do, uh, the better it is. Well, I definitely want to get it out there because I, I think people will find it very interesting. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a lot of interest. I, I take people on a lot, on a lot of a lot of rides on the uh, on the uh, book. So uh, books, and then my little uh, my, my little uh, boy, the little the boy from Nan is a, is a Christian. It's my only Christian novel. Yeah, it's a standalone. I'd love people to read that too. Now I know you're on LinkedIn. Um, you have any other social media? Uh, well, I have a, uh, a on Facebook and Instagram and uh, LinkedIn, and um, I think that's about it. I'm I'm learning to do more blogging. I want to blog, 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 and to get it out there. My right now, excuse me, I don't have a uh, website. My son's going to make one for me though this month. He 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 promises. We'll see, and because uh, I, I I think you really need that. And uh, it helps. Yeah, I think that's that's about about it. And my my website is uh, sci.young.junior at austin.rr.com. And uh, people can go go there and find out. Oh, you just type in scyoungbooks.com with that scyoungbooks without any uh, periods or anything, book.com. And you can pull up all my books on Amazon. Okay, I'm definitely going to put that in the in the description. I want to get your get your books promoted as much as possible because that'd be great, Kyle. It'd really be great. All know? the all the stories that you've told me and and the little bit of talking we got to do before the interview, I I, I find it uh, the people are going to find it interesting. I do. I hope so that's great. It, it's all happened and it was fun and it was, I, I couldn't believe some of the stuff that happened. Oh, I, one thing I forgot to tell you about Buster Keaton, he was, when he was, he was in vaudeville, you know, and mm -hmm. he was in 
brought up as as a as a, as a, a vaudeville performer, and his family were vaudeville and everything. And his father used to pick him up when he was like six years old and throw him against the wall. He'd flat and fall and, and, and slide down the wall. And women would go; they would go all around. And they would they they say, this, "You can't do this. This is this is this man's terrible. You can't do this. You're killing this kid." It didn't hurt. It never hurt Buster because he knew how to fall. He got to take a fall. And and once he was standing in in I think it was to, in in Kansas somewhere in a hotel on the first floor. And there's a tornado. And he went to the window to look out and it picked him right up, turned him around, turned him upside down, and landed on him, landed him on his feet on the on outside. So he has, he has really fascinating things happen. All right. You know what I think we should do is if you have the time, we should do some more shows in the future, just you telling stories, because this is fascinating. Well, great. I hope I have some more stories to tell by. <laughs> by that time this is why i tell people get out and meet your neighbors you know too many of us are so stuck on our phones and computers yeah. and things yeah. and you know you just take some time get to know your neighbors people always yeah. have a fascinating story to tell yeah, and you never know who you're going to meet you can meet anybody it's incredible people can be an inspiration to others and i think that you are an inspiration I hope somebody that watches this or listens to this is motivated to chase their dreams. Well, I, that's great, Kyle. I do too. Absolutely. And well, it's great to see you and to, to talk to you and talk to you and want to hear all about you and everything how you're doing. And, and we'll just, we'll build something here. There you go. Well, it's been an honor. I, I told you before, it was, it was an honor to meet you and for you to take time out of your day to be here with us. And I look forward to doing this more in the future. Same here, Kyle. Well, to everyone out there, if you're new to the channel, uh, thank you for stopping by. Uh, I hope you come back. Please subscribe. And to those that are, are regulars, uh, thank you for your support. Uh, we are growing. Uh, things are starting to take off, and I'm, I'm very pleased. So many people are starting to find interest in the videos that I make uh, and all the people that I bring on. Uh, we just want to bring some positivity in the world. And so... To all of you, I say have a wonderful day. God bless and peace. Me too. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.